doing? I want to talk today about design. Um, and uh, when I was growing up in my living room, we had a bunch of Eames chairs, the uh, standard potato chip chairs. And I thought they were the ugliest things in the world. Um, and it turned out that my parents had a lot of taste, uh, which I found out when I went to design school. And, and for, I think, a lot of us, that's design, right? Um, beautiful objects and maybe beautiful print and beautiful artifacts. Um, and I think that was true for a very long uh, period of time, mostly post-industrial revolution, at least for industrial design. Um, and then it sort of evolved and design became about problem solving. Uh, and I think a lot of that had to do with technology being really friggin' hard and systems sort of spiraling out of control. Uh, and so we needed a way to um, solve problems in a non-engineering fashion, right? in a way that uh, was a little bit more about people. I think it's evolved again. I think it's evolved to be about value. And I think that value is actually driven by this, this word empathy that um, maybe is overused, myself included. Um, but I want to talk today about how you can drive that sense of value in your design work. Um, this is maybe a talk both about value and empathy, because I think the two are interrelated. Um, briefly, empathy is about seeing the world through someone else, else's eyes. It's about walking in their shoes. And I'd like you to take a little thought exercise for a second. Look through my eyes. And it's not about understanding what I see. You could say, oh, there's a crowd of people and they look angry because they're thinking intently. But instead, feel what I feel to be on stage. And you might come up with a number of different ideas, and many might be right, and many might be wrong. Okay? That's the idea of empathy, and you have to guess. And you can get close, and I want to talk a little bit about how you get close today. Um, and I think it goes through a, a process, and it's a repeatable process. Okay? And the first step of that process is to watch what people do. Okay? It's not watch what people say or listen to what people say. And so when we're solving problems or creating value, we go out in the world and we watch behavior. We watch people. Okay? And we watch what they do rather than asking them questions, doing a questionnaire, running a focus group. Okay? We watch actual behavior. And that generates a lot of data. And the data is non-conclusive because it's human data. It's illogical. It's emotional. Okay, it's about our wants and needs and desires. And so we try to synthesize that data into meaning. Okay, and that means we interpret the data. You make inference. You make inference upon the data in order to move to the idea of insight. And an insight is a provocative statement of truth about human behavior. Okay, it's a statement that is sweeping. It's a sweeping generalization. It's about everyone, even though it's grounded in behavioral research about the few. And then we make something. Okay? There's our four-step process. We do the traditional design work. Okay? So we do qualitative research. We synthesize the data. We establish and evoke insight. And then we make something. Okay? Seems simple. I think it is simple. I think it's extraordinarily simple. I want to give you three stories today. I want to tell you three stories about this simple process and how it uh, works. And the first actually comes from um, three of my students, uh, Samara, Jeff, and Lauren. And they were studying debt personal debt. Okay? They wanted to understand, but more importantly, they wanted to empathize with what it's like to carry debt. And uh, for those with credit cards, the average is $15,000 balance, okay? which is phenomenal. And if you think about actually getting out of that process, it seems fairly hopeless. And so what they did was the process that I just described. They conducted qualitative research with people who have debt. Okay? They talked to a woman um, who described that she never learned how to balance a checkbook, so she doesn't feel like an adult. And she went to school here in Austin, and she said, they taught us Texas history four times, but they never taught me how to balance a checkbook. Okay? For her, she doesn't feel like a grown-up because she can't manage her finances. They talked to a guy named Ross who carries $7,000 balance on his credit card. He showed them his credit cards. Right? They undid his wallet, and there's like eight of them. He has a corporate Amex. He doesn't have a corporate job. Okay? <laughs> and he describes how in the moment... It's extraordinarily difficult for him to restrain himself from a purchase. He went on what you could call a binge vacation. Okay? He's in debt, and he took himself on vacation. Okay? So it's incredible. So they um, extracted this idea of an insight through this process of synthesis uh, that immediate gratification is more important than the delayed anxiety. Okay? And that becomes an implication for design. And so what they created is a very, very simple design. Uh, you link your checking account to your credit card, and then throughout the day, you get text messages that say, hey, you're, you're enjoying a cup of coffee right now. Why don't you tip yourself a dollar? 
yes or no? And you text back yes or no. And when you text back yes, it transfers the dollar toward your credit card balance. And they conducted a pilot. And one of the fellows that they did the pilot with, and this is representative of all of the people they did the pilot with over uh, seven weeks, put $94 to his credit balance, which seems insignificant. But if you play that out over the course of his balance and compounding interest, he's going to save himself two years and thousands of dollars. Okay? Very simple design that comes out of this qualitative process, watching behavior, synthesizing it, extracting insight, and building something. Okay, here's another story I want to tell you. And this is, again, about two of my students, uh, Laura and Marianne, and they were studying aging. Okay, and again, we can offer some um, quantitative statistics, if you like. Uh, the number last I checked is uh, 48,000 or 50, uh, sorry, 48 million or 50 million um, baby boomers are retiring, over 65. Okay, and that's extraordinary. If you think about the pressure on the health system, the way that these people want to retire, which is not in a nursing home, right? aging in place. Okay, so they studied that and they didn't study it through Google. They studied it again through qualitative research based on behavior. And they met a woman named Annette who's 80 something years old and she wouldn't tell him. Okay. Um, and Annette uh, will um, talk to us and, and said that she drives herself to the hospital when there's a problem and doesn't tell her sons. Because she's afraid that if she tells her sons, uh, she's going to lose her car. Think a little bit about that. You're now the child, and you're in a position to dictate rules to your parent. Okay, we talked to another person who told us, uh, who told the students a very, very similar story. Um, she lives in a uh, really large house with two master bedrooms, and the reason is because she's trying to convince her uh, mother to move in with her, because she doesn't think her mother can actually live on her own. The mother doesn't want to move in with her. And again, there's this social dynamic that we learn about through this qualitative ethnographic research process that allows us to get to these hidden gems. They synthesized that data and they extracted the insight that there's a power play change between the young adult or old adult, if you'd like, and the senior. And then they created something as a result of that. They created a very simple card game. And the card game uh, is called True Story. Um, and you, you pull a card, and it says something like, tell me when you were pulled over by the police. And either party answers it. And then the other party tries to decide if it's true or false. And that's the game. And you play it with your elderly parents. And they played it with elderly parents, participants, again, a pilot study. Um, and they heard a story about uh, a woman who couldn't button her shirts anymore and was buying only buttonless clothing. And this was an indicator that she was starting to get arthritic, but she didn't want to come out and say, I think I have a problem with my joints. Okay. Again, a qualitative ethnographic research process helps us build empathy. We synthesize the data. We extract insight from it, and we build something. Again, a very simple process. I'll tell you a third story, and this comes from my own work. Um, in addition to running a school, I'm also the VP of design at a company called Blackboard. I was at a startup that got acquired by Blackboard, and Blackboard is the largest educational software company in the United States. Um, and we're working hard to humanize our software, which traditionally hasn't been. Um, many of you probably used it in college. I used it in grad school, and it was the same as it is now. <laughs> and we followed the exact same process. We spent time with college students. We went in their dorm rooms. We looked through their bags with their permission. They gave us tours of their dorm. We watched them do what co college students do, which is their homework, watch TV, smoke pot, hang out, okay? ethnographic research. And we be began to see uh, insights emerge. And so we synthesized the data. And we arrive at a place where it becomes evident that college students don't know. They don't understand the process that they're in and the environment that they're in. And I'll give you a couple examples. We talked to a woman um, who was a uh, late stage senior, I'm sorry, a late stage freshman, um, just, just out of uh, high school as a senior, and she had to declare a major. And remember back to when you had to declare a major. Um, it reminds me of the office when he declares bankruptcy. <laughs> he had to declare a major. And show, so when she picked the major, she picked accounting because it was the first choice in the drop down. We heard another story um, about uh, a girl who was explaining to us that um, she was going to major in, um, and I think it was business, not, um, not regular business, international business, better. 
this is what she told us. And then she was going to go on to law school, and then she was going to get a job, and then she was going to get married, and then, and I quote, the rest of your life happens, you just get old. <laughs> and this sort of pre-digested story about how the world works comes from this ethnographic behavioral research. Okay? This empathetic way that I can see the world through a 19-year-old's eyes, even though I'm no longer that person. We then synthesize that data, right? We make meaning out of it, we interpret it, and we arrive at an insight that, um, in fact, college, the biggest problem is not academic. It's not knowledge acquisition, it's anxiety. And the biggest thing we can drive are tools that minimize anxiety. And so that becomes what's called the value proposition of all of our products at Blackboard. Instead of saying, we're gonna give you features and functions and make it easy to use and help you solve problems around learning, we're saying, we're gonna help minimize the anxiety you have around school. And we're doing that in a number of ways. One is um, something called an academic planner, which basically looks at the courses you've taken and says to you, you know what, you may have pre wrecked yourself out of a bunch of classes on the way to a major that you want, but don't worry. You can still take these other paths and arrive at the same career opportunities. You don't have to major in engineering to be an engineer. You don't have to major in design to be a designer. And so if junior year, you discover your passion, it's okay. We'll help you find that path toward a solution. Okay? We combine that with videos from alumni, right? Videos from some celebrities and famous people. We're leveraging what's called the Road Trip Nation Video Archive. It's a PBS series just about this topic. Okay? And again, we arrived at this solution through a process. We observe human behavior right, in order to empathize with people who are not like us. We synthesize that data into meaningful insights, and then we build something and test it. Okay. So reflect on this a little bit. I've been talking about empathy through a process, but really I'm talking about value. Okay. Think a little bit about why you're here, and you're expectant. Okay. You're giving me your time and attention, and you're expecting value back. And that's a value promise, and it comes from Ben, and it comes from Creative Mornings, and in a way, it comes from me. Okay? I need to deliver, and it's an emotional value proposition because uh, this is an experience. Okay? You're not actually getting utility out of this. You're getting emotional response. And so that level of value is something you can derive and extract from this process, and it changes the way you think about design as a profession. Sure, you make beautiful things. Absolutely part of it. Remember step four, you still gotta make stuff. And sure, you solve problems because you're identifying things that are problematic, but they're not utilitarian problems that you can simply solve by banging a hammer with a nail. They're emotional problems that you solve through empathy. Thanks very much, I appreciate your time this morning. <laughs>